The Center for Global Education that uh, was opened in 2008 by the Global Education Committee is pleased to present this panel to you tonight. These panelists will comment on the 18 days of protests in Egypt and the momentous culmination on Friday, February 11th, when President Hosni Mubarak resigned after 30 years in power. I know that most of you have been transfixed by the news and that maybe like me, uh, last Friday you were overwhelmed with emotions. We hope that tonight's conversation will help to answer your questions and will lead you to better understand how we are all interconnected and how therefore we really do need to engage in global education and learning about one another across the globe. Um, before we start, I'd like to thank all of our colleagues who worked really, really a lot to put this together in a very short number of days. Um, a long list of us, including Scott, who's back there helping us, and Janine and uh, Cynthia. Um, and of course, the panelists who are here. I want to thank them all for helping us to organize this really important conversation. Um, I know, I want to introduce now Dr. Cynthia Reese. Uh, she's a faculty member at West Valley College's Fine Arts Department and the co-chair of the West Valley Global Education Committee. And she will introduce each of the panelists. Welcome. Lots of introductions, lots of introductions. Sorry, we'll get started very quickly. But one of the first things that I would like to do is I'd like to give public praise to these individuals over here who have um, spent or decided and committed uh, this hour and a half or these two hours that we're going to be spending tonight or hour and a half that we're going to be spending tonight to dialogue about this incredibly important event. And I've just got to say that this happened in one and a half weeks. Um, and when I first contacted each and every one of them without hesitation, they said, yes, I would love to participate in this dialogue, which again says to me and emphasizes to me how important this was to each of them, but also how important this is to the lives of people in Egypt as well as the world. Um, so let me start without further ado uh, with each of the introductions and maybe I'll start over here. Is that okay? Okay, Jacqueline and I'm going, to, because there is so much to say about each of them, I'm going to unfortunately have to go to my notes. Jacqueline Thurston is an artist, writer, and professor emerita for San Jose State University. She has been the recipient of not one, but two NEA fellowships. She, in 2006, lived and worked in Egypt as a Fulbright and has spent um, quite a bit of time afterwards in Egypt too as well. Uh, Dr. Gerald Gridson. Gridson. Gridson, sorry, Dr. Gerald Gridson. Um, did his graduate work um, at Columbia University several degrees in history, philosophy, and Middle East studies, including uh, his doctorate, but he also earned another doctorate in economic development and worked in the field for 15 years with his own company. He joined in 2005 the philosophy department of San Jose City College, where he teaches courses in philosophy and world religions, and in 2010, he joined the global studies faculty of San Jose City College and co-led a tour of students and faculty to Egypt in January of this year? Last year. Of last year, of 2010. In the fall of 2011, he'll be facilitating the Salia program at San Jose State, which brings together students from the Middle East and San Jose State, San Jose City College, and Santa Clara University uh, via a form of Skype. His recent research and writings have been focused on the historical interaction of Christianity and Islam in the Middle East during the medieval and early modern eras and contemporary movements within Islam that engage Islam with the modern world. Um, I did a search on Amazon and he has quite a few books that he's edited, maybe five or six, I believe, co-edited and also wrote. And then we have Mr. Professor Sami Ibrahim. 
He completed his undergraduate education at the University of Ain Sham in Cairo, Egypt. He pursued his graduate work in chemistry and soil science at the University of Alberta, University of uh, California, Davis, and at San Jose State University. He's taught chemi chemistry for over 30 years at San Jose uh, City College, Evergreen Valley College, as well as San Jose State University, and he's currently an adjunct professor at San Jose City College. Since 2001, uh, uh, Professor Sammy Ibrahim chaired the Middle Eastern Heritage Celebration Planning Group at San Jose City College, and he served on the board of directors of the Arab American Cultural Center in Silicon, Val in Silicon Valley. In January of 2010, he coordinated a 16-day educational journey to Egypt that included 48 faculty, students, and friends from the San Jose area. And then we have a Dr. Khalil Baroum. Sorry. And Dr. Khalil Baroum received his MA in English Literature, a second MA and PhD in Linguistics at Georgetown. Upon graduating, he joined Stanford um, and taught in the Department of Linguistics and is coordinator of the program of African and Middle Eastern Languages and Literatures in the Division of Culture, Literature, and Languages at Stanford. He has, been in, he has been interviewed and has spoken frequently on topics in the Middle East, um, as well as foreign policy in the United States, as well as the Arab-Israeli conflict. conflict. Um, Arab, uh, I'm sorry, Israeli-Palestine conflict. Um, without further ado, I would love to present these four scholars, as well as our two Fulbright scholars here at West Valley College. And our two Fulbright scholars, are Lotfi Arbab, who is a Fulbright Scholar that is studying business administration at uh, West Valley College here. He was born and raised in Cairo. Um, he ha holds a Bachelor's of Science in Tourism and worked in restaurant management. And we also have Mustafa Moaz Ayesh Ibrahim, Fulbright Scholar studying uh, business administration here too as well. Um, studied English literature at Al-Hazar University in Egypt from 2002 and through 2007. Okay, thank you and welcome. One more quick technical detail. What we'd like to do is have each panelist maybe spend five to six minutes talking about their opinions and their um, uh, thoughts on what's going on in Egypt at this particular moment. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, it's not in the agenda, but I need to excuse you to have like 30 seconds moment of silence for our martyrs in this, uh, in these massacres. So please. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not good in speech, but uh, I'm very honored to be among these distinguished guests uh, to speak about my country, my country, Egypt. Uh, I'm here like five months, six months, and I have the same question, like, uh, where is Egypt? Is it in Asia or I don't know? It's, it's like that. But now I'm from Egypt and I'm proud to say that I'm from Egypt. Uh, what our brothers and sisters in Egypt did was a, a, great, a great thing and I'm, 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 I regret that I'm not there. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you and, and thank you very much. Hi. Um, I'm here in the uh, United States since August and we faced, as my friends say, the same questions. Where is Egypt? But some people say it is in Caribbean, some people say it is in Asia, but now I think all of us know it is North Africa. <laughs> and um, 
you know, it was too hard for us to be here and watching all these uh, historical events or historical things happened back in our home and we can't do anything. And we spend long, long nights because it is a time it's different here night, there it's morning. And if I slept, my, my friend come quickly and look, there is a new news about Egypt. But now I think we are not us, uh, the Egyptians, but all of us, all of uh, free nations, all free peoples, proud of us. And for me, Egypt will be the source of inspiration to the all nations in this century, as usual, <laughs> from the old, old uh, ages, people, Egypt teach people how to, how, what's the meaning of culture, how the meaning of civilizations, and now it is teach people again how to be free. And uh, I would like to thank you again for uh, joining us and celebrating our uh, revolution. Thank you. Good evening. I would like to start off by congratulating Egyptians in this hall, as well as Egyptians everywhere, on their hard-earned victory last Friday which has proved that police states are powerless in the face of people power. In a nutshell, what the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt demonstrate to the <coughs> is that the despotic and unrepresentative uh, regimes in the Arab world will not have anybody, any power, including the United States of America secure them and save them from the wrath of their own people. During the uprising in Tahrir Square, an American journalist bearing witness to people power wrote, and I quote, I'm in Tahrir Square and all of all the amazing things one sees here, the one that strikes me most is a bearded man who's galloping up and down, literally screaming himself hoarse, saying, I feel free, I feel free. Gathered around him are Egyptians of all ages, and they all are holding cell phones, taking pictures, and video of this man, determined to capture the moment in case it never comes again. I have no doubt that the United States will not give up its tight grip on Egypt's affairs voluntarily. But I also know that things will not go back to where they were before January 25th, when matters used to be decided by one man without any regard to his people's aspirations or his own nation's real interests. In perfect hindsight, pundits now acknowledge that Egypt was quite ripe for a revolution. They point to a system that was rife with corruption, nepotism, and cronyism, a system that can best be described as a repressive kleptocracy, a system that took its people for granted and had little, if any, respect for their political economic, or human rights. Sadly, through it all, five different US administrations stuck by the Mubarak regime, a regime that is corrupt to the core and extremely repressive to its own population. The US is a great country for its people but it suffers a serious case of political myopia whereby its values are greatly compromised 
by what it sees as its own national interests, especially with regard to third world people. In the Arab world, the saying goes, don't listen much to US rhetoric about peace, democracy, and human rights. You only need to watch US actions on the ground. While the US government speaks of freedom and democracy, in the eyes of Arabs in the street, it pursues imperial goals of advancing its interests over its values, all the while harboring real conceits of permanent domination. Remarkably, the collective memory of our body politic is so feeble and so corrupt that we see history repeating itself almost on a regular basis. From Iran's Shah to <coughs> the Philippines' Marcos to Nicaragua's Somozas to Baby Doc in Haiti and now Hosni Mubarak of Egypt. In each of these cases, to cite just a few, we have been constantly tainted by close alliances with some of the most repressive regimes in modern history. And yet, we so hypocritically continued to tout our commitment to cherished universal values such as democracy and freedom, as if our words were a substitute for our deeds, as if the Arab masses would be too duped by our rhetoric to see the day-to-day -day tragic consequences of our actions in their midst. In the words of Roger Cohen, who wrote yesterday in the New York Times saying, we've tried invasion of Muslim lands, we've tried imposing new systems of government on them, we've tried wars on terror, we've tried spending billions of dollars. What we haven't tried is tackling what's been rotten in this Arab world by helping a homegrown, bottom-up movement for change to turn a US-backed uh, uh, police state into a stable democracy. He concludes, and so do I, overcome 9-11 through 2-11. The road to reconciliation leads not through Baghdad or Kabul, but through Tahrir. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to share some thoughts with you. <clears throat> I would like to begin by saying that I am the product of three wonderful cultures, Egyptian, Arabic, and American cultures. I came to America when I was 20, and I lived here for the more than 40 years. There are two events that will always be engraved in my mind. 9-11 and 2-11. Last Thursday night was my most difficult night. I was glued to the TV watching Al Jazeera station. Mubarak still refused to leave. And hundreds of thousands are chanting, Irhal, go away, go away. The next day is Friday. I expected really a very bloody Friday with masses of people all over Egypt that's marching. And then early on Friday morning came the news. <coughs> Mubarak is out. I jumped with joy. I screamed and my wife came running to see what's wrong. And instead of trying to calm me down, she gave me the, um, the Egyptian flag instead, which made it worse. <laughs> I even jumped higher. Here is the flag she gave me. It was amazing uh, to see newspapers in this area with Egyptian flags all over the place. Never seen this before. And photographs of the Shaheed Khalid Said 
who was murdered by the police in Egypt and by Wael Ghanim of Google. Now, to many Americans, the uprising was a big surprise, but not to me. I go to Egypt like every three years. And every time I go there, I am very happy to see my family, but it was very depressing to see the level of poverty, despair, and corruption. I spoke to a friend of mine, he's a professor in Egypt, a dean of agriculture, and I told him Egypt will explode. He said, no, that's impossible. He lives there while I come and go, and I can see things he cannot see. That's very common, by the way. They haven't noticed what's going on around them, but I did see it. You may know that at one time in the past, Egypt and South Korea had the same standard of living. South Korea went this way, and Egypt went this way. I was amazed, why? We are blessed in Egypt with many natural resources. We have two seas with a wonderful coastline. The Nile Valley, agriculture, natural gas, power from the dam, the Suez Canal, big income, and tourism. Where does the money go? Everybody is wondering where did it go? I understand there were $70 billion in Swiss banks that belonged to Mubarak. I wonder where it came from. Now, with all that wealth, and above all, the Egyptians are very capable and very skillful. And still, most people earn $2 a day. How could this be? It is no wonder that the whole world is mesmerized by the Egyptian revolution. The fuse was lit in Tunisia. And both Ghanim and, and Khalid, Sha Khalid Saeed were the catalysts. But Egypt was about to explode, but you need a spark and the spark came from Tunisia. America admires courage, and what's happening in Egypt has and will inspire other oppressed peoples to emulate the accomplishments of the Egyptian youth who have shown that there is an alternative to the counterproductive tactics of fanatics. Since 9-11, I have had the honor of chairing the Middle Eastern Heritage Celebration at my school. I want to show the American students and faculty to teach about the rich culture, the wonderful heritage of the Middle East. Both Jerry and I co-chaired these annual events. We invited writers, historians, uh, politicians, we invited artists, fine artists, musicians, dancers, folk dancers. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Jay and others, I think the program is well received and sponsored by my college. The next annual event, by the way, is held in April, the first two weeks in April, and we have a wonderful program again this year. Now, a year ago, actually three years ago, I wanted to show my colleagues and my students what Egypt is like. So I coordinated a 16-day trip to Egypt. We went to the typical tourist sites. We did that. But more importantly, we went to universities and colleges and organizations. 
Uh, students and faculty had face-to-face -face encounter with the Egyptian students and professors. At the conclusion of each event, we invite the students to come to lunch with us for more discussions. The experience of our students were very transformative to our students. They haven't realized the generosity and the fine culture of Egypt, because most tourists will just go from the pyramids, the museum, without speaking to the people. But we did. I'm very grateful to Jerry and to Jacqueline and Dr. Abdelmagoud Darderi, who made the trip wonderful and um, hopefully I will plan another trip in next year, in January. You're all invited. Thank you. What I'd like to focus on would be where we go from here. Uh, we, we've all been following the events in Egypt uh, very closely, I think most of us, and what a wonderful uh, event it has been, in the, not just in the history of Egypt, but in the history of the world. Uh, I teach uh, uh, philosophy and world religions, and I try to point out to my students that when you compare this revolution, you go back to the French Revolution, you look at the rev and you, the, how violent it was, and up until the modern times with Gandhi and Martin Luther King, we didn't have many examples of nonviolent revolutions. Here in Egypt, with the exception of the people that were inflicting violence on the demonstrators, this is a wonderful example, not just of a political revolution, but I would call it a spiritual revolution. I don't think we can look at this just as in political terms. These were people that were inspired by some deep uh, spirituality, which I think characterizes Egypt. When you had a mass in Tahrir Square, where Christians and Muslims could come together and realize their common humanity, their common solidarity. That is a spiritual experience, and that's what we need in the world, this kind of witness to transform the world, away from violence, away from a conflict. And to me, this is what this is all about. This isn't just a witness for the Arab world. This is a witness for the whole world. This is a, a message that can be communicated then that this is possible. You don't need to use violence. We spend about $900 billion a year in our military in the United States. $900 billion. That money could be going to education, to health care, to so many things. We, the, the thing is we need to do is not bemoan what happened before. How do we go forward? We need to get our government to take that money that goes into military and say, how about cultural programs? How about educational programs? How about lessening this dependence on military power and saying what works is this spiritual power, the power of the people. This is what we're learning from this event that if we can spread that message and convince our own government, we're not gonna convince them by just saying, oh, how terrible we were. No, we have to say there's another power available to us and that power is what the Egyptian people showed us. Now, here, uh, let's see, can I get the next slide? There we go, okay. We were at Al-Azhar University, and we have some members of our team here tonight. And this was when we came to Al-Azhar, and we had a wonderful dialogue uh, with Egyptian students. Let's see if it's going, here we go. Okay, here we're meeting some of the students. And what we learned from this event is that we have so much in common. We have so many ways. We met with uh, a group of uh, students and they gave a presentation on Abraham, uh, Moses, and Jesus. And it was a wonderful dialogue program. And it, this is Sammy here. And these are some of the students we met, both male and female. Even though we are very different culturally, we, it did, we, the, the meeting led, this was one of our African-American faculty members, uh, Elaine Wallace. Uh, who is with us. We had four universities represented and three uh, students from three different institutions. And you can see the difference, seemingly difference, but what came out of this was a, a tremendous sense of unity of purpose. And so, not, and this is uh, some of the faculty from uh, Al-Azhar. Al and uh, here's our own State Department played a very important role. We hear a lot of the 
bad things our government does, but this is one thing they're doing very well. There's an English language program at Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar happens to be the oldest, at least it claims to be the oldest Muslim university in the Middle East. It goes back to the 10th century, before Oxford or Cambridge, and it has 450,000 students. So it is the most influential center of learning in the Muslim world. So our government is, has this English language resource center, and uh, Robert Lindsay, who directs it, worked with us to set this program together. Who is this guy on top? I'm not sure who that is. Mubarak. Oh, Mubarak. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were talking about standing there. So this was our presentation. These are some of our American uh, colleagues. And then what was nice afterwards, we went for a meal together. So this is the kind of event we need to promote for the future, going f in the future. Instead of giving all our money to the Egyptian military, like we've been doing, which is, you know, I'm sure we're going to keep doing some of that, let's put uh, money into these cultural exchanges, these programs, like the um, program that our gentleman over here on the right have, include these kinds of programs in global studies everywhere, where American people begin to see the quality of people in the Middle East, that it's not just an image you see on Fox News of some terrorist over in Pakistan. We have to create a new story for us together, a new narrative, and Egypt provides that for us. So I'll just show a few more of our photos again. Um, I'm going to stop Al there. Gardens, right? Yeah, Al Azhar Gardens, right in Cairo. <laughs> so sharing a meal together, <coughs> you begin to realize you're part of one family, and that's what we need to going forward, I think, stress. Thank you. So I'm going to... And so I can see you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm going to begin by reading from an email that I received this morning from... El Mastaba Folk Music Center in Zamalek, which is one of the communities in Cairo. And it says, we are at the beginning of a new day in the history of Egypt, in which every Egyptian can claim justice, respect, not on the basis of wealth or power, but on their membership in the human community, on their membership in the human community. And so taking that as my theme, I am going to introduce you to some of the people who changed my life when I lived in Egypt. So what do I do with, oh. So, you know, it, this is personal, but when we meet one another on a personal basis, it has incredible potential to change the political environment. Did I say that clearly? This is very private, very personal relationships that I'm going to talk about. But when we are touched by meeting and knowing another person, particularly someone who is truly foreign to us, that has the potential to build a political transformation. So these are images that I do not think we see and one is fathers with sons. And Egyptian fathers are, in my experience, wonderfully loving and generous and open with their children. So, okay, so how do, okay. And we don't see, we don't see images of young married couples, happy and beautifully dressed for their family occasion. So, okay. whoops. Technology is wonderful only when it works. Yeah, that work. Okay. And we don't see, I believe, young professional men working without carrying AK 47s. This is um, one of my uh, close collaborators. He's an Egyptologist and he's working in Karnak, he's an architect, and he's doing drawings of the current discoveries of Roman baths. And I don't think we see images of young Egyptian students 
women. And these are three of my students on a felucca on the Nile. And they're joyous, and they're outgoing, and they're, by the way, beautifully dressed. They don't go to college classes in their pajamas and their slippers. And as a part of trying to get to know my students, I asked them if they would tell me their name, and I would try to write it in my fledgling Arabic, which was always uh, <clears throat> disastrous, but wonderful, because then they could correct me. And she said, my name is Jihad, and I'm trying to spell Jihad, remember, which is J, and I'm not thinking about Jihad, what that means. So I said, well, what does your name mean? And she said, well, it means I need to, I need to work hard to improve myself, see them nodding, to do the best, to be good at school. And so I want you to see this face of Jihad. Now this is very hard for me to talk about uh, because I don't have words for it, but I visited um, a women's center in Alexandria and I got off the train and I'm the only Westerner at the train station and two women come towards me and one of them is this woman completely veiled wearing the niqab and something shifted, I don't have words for it, in that moment because, because maybe you can help me with it. It was just foreign, it was different, it wasn't fear, it was more like, okay. And of course, here she is, she drives, she talks on her mobile phone, all while navigating the traffic of Alexandria, and by the way, she has an American passport. She was born in Wisconsin and lived there until she was six. She's divorced, lives apart from her husband. She's a professional woman. She's full of contradictions, just full of contradictions. And she immediately makes me unwrap all of the stereotypes that might have been at work when I first saw her come to meet me. And when I was a guest at a school in Hergada, this young student was my guide, and she was asked to bring me flowers. <laughs> so this is, a, this is an example of the generosity of spirit that informs this culture. So she brought these huge bouquets, and I unwrapped them and put them on the hotel desk, and people came and had their photographs taken beside them. And I don't think we see images like this image of Gailia, who is my Arabic instructor of uh, professional women who have, who, who have raised families, who are out working. And I think you can see what a warm and welcoming and, of course, very intelligent uh, individual she is. This is the last image, and it's the hardest for me to, to talk about. This is Um Ahmed, which means the mother of Ahmed, the oldest son. And um, I'm getting caught in the feeling at the moment. She invited me up to her rooftop. So we went up these steps, which were broken and filled with sand. And up on the top, there was this improvisational, rather simply put together series of chicken coops. And she was so proud to show me the three different kinds of chickens that she had on her rooftop. And she also had a dove cot, and one of the sons opened the dove cot, and all the doves flew out. And just at that moment, she reached up and gave me a kiss on the cheek. And I want to end with this image because I think, once again, that when we meet one another as individuals, the political implications are extraordinary. I mean, after all, I'm all of the things that she might find off-putting, I'm divorced, I live alone, I'm rather secular in my orientation, but we made this wonderful and unforgettable
connection with one another. And I'd also like to end with a, a kind of request for each of us to, <clears throat> to look at the stereotypes that we might hold consciously or unconsciously of individuals in the Middle East and, and examine how we might shift or change that and also to ask if what stereotypes they might hold of each of us. After all, in what way do each of us as individuals really find ourselves reflected in Hollywood films, which is how most of them know us? Is that how you want them to know us? And Jerry made this plea for or statement about concrete action, and it reminded me that today I got a letter, an email from the Fulbright Association asking for letters of support for the program, which is going to be cut, one proposal is by 20%. And my thought is that maybe that's a program that we might increase by 20% rather than decrease by, by 20%. So if you feel, um, that that's a small political statement that you could make or would like to make, I could give you uh, the email link to that website and you could send your, you could send their letter to your, to your congressman. So, shokran jazila, which means thank you very much. In 2007, that's three years and some months ago, everyone spoke about Egypt being in a pre-revolutionary period. So the question arises, where was the State Department? I mean, I'm just an artist and writer uh, dreaming my dreams and thinking my thoughts. And it's not just in the academic world, but shopkeepers, everyone spoke of Egypt as being in a pre-revolutionary period. And everyone said, no one will tolerate Mubarak or Gamal. Something will happen. I think the, the system itself, not Obama, not Bush, not Clinton for that matter, is what needs to be looked at. I mean, we've always found it a lot easier for us to deal with despots, with dictators, one man rule. Because democracy, as you know, is messy. Democracy is not guaranteed to give you what you want whenever you ask for it. And thus, when it comes to, to the Arab world with its you know, vast oil resources, we've always valued stability, quote unquote, over you know, democracy. And uh, we spent $70 billion on intelligence every single year. And this intelligence has been caught off guard or has been wrong every step of the way on the fall of the Soviet Union, on the fall of the Shah, right? On, you know, Hosni Mubarak, on, you know, just name it. Everything on uh, Iraq and, you know, WMDs and, and so on and so forth. It just doesn't seem to me, I'm, I'm, I'm talking basically to myself at, at this point, 
that there is any kind of self-examination that is, you know, uh, uh, going on within the American political system. I mean, I don't see any changes in how we gather information, so-called intelligence, how we approach these, these countries, how we, you know, try to reconcile our so-called you know, valued interests with the maybe legitimate interests of, of these people. So whenever you hear about, you know, what's going to, you know, come after uh, Mubarak, what's going to come after Saddam, what's going to, to me, it's a canard, simply because it, it, it's uh, almost designed to forestall any change at all costs. And who are we to tell the Egyptians who they want to elect? If it's, it's going to be a, a, a democracy, let them elect, the, let, let them go through the, the throes of, you know, democratic change. I mean, our country went through it. We, had, we even had a civil war and so on and so forth. So why is it good for us and denied to, to others? Uh, it, it, it just seems to me really so kind of arrogant, so imperialistic that we're constantly lecturing other people on what kind of rule, what kind of regime, what kind of government they need to be having, even though we tell them, you know, we're for self-determination, we're for democracy, we're for democratic elections, and when these democratic elections take place, invariably we're against them, as happened in, you know, the, the occupied territories when Hamas took over. I mean, we, we were the ones actually in 2005 who encouraged the, the elections, thinking that the result will be different. But the minute we got what we didn't want, then we sanctioned the, the, the people and starved them, uh, as, in, as is in the case uh, with uh, Gaza. So uh, this is a long-winded answer to your question. I don't think it's just Obama who blew it. I think the system is so rigged to always put a, a premium value on interests, on so-called stability, over democracy, over human rights, over real national interests of these different, different countries. That, that's what I think. Yes, because we don't have a mic. So your question is, if you could please. Uh, explain the similarities between Egypt and 79, or I mean, Iran in 79 and Egypt of today. The similarities between Iran in 79 and Egypt today. Uh, Egypt has never had a religious government like in Iran. Uh, the Egyptian uh, scholars of religion uh, have never really uh, ruled Egypt. Uh, Iran is different. Iran is different. It's a wonderful nation, very emotional people, uh, with very firm beliefs. I don't think that Egypt will ever accept a religious government. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood tried, they haven't succeeded. The question also is this, will democracy work in Egypt? Let me remind most of you and my young Egyptian friends that before 1952, Egypt had a king, King Farouk. And before that, we had a very thriving democracy, a liberal, uh, secular democracy. We had elections, we had parties, where the parliament was two chambers. It's so wonderful to see, to hear the people debate and criticize the government in the assembly. We're simply going to go back to before 1952, uh, when Egypt indeed had three elections, several political parties, and, um, and Egypt at that time was a very prosperous nation as well. I just want to point out too that Egypt has had a more modern culture. We have the American University in Cairo. There was a feminist movement in Egypt 
uh, they approved women's vote, I think, before we had it in the United States. So Egypt is a uh, much different uh, country in that the modern world has taken hold, not to say it hasn't taken hold in Iran, but I don't think Egypt would ever accept a theocracy, uh, which is the Iranian revolution. This is saying something different. It became a theocratic government uh, run by the religious establishment. I can't, I've never seen that in times that I've studied the uh, Egyptian history, even though back to the pharaoh uh, was a religious figure, but in, after the uh, end of the British rule, Egypt really has been a uh, much more modern part of the Arab world than, say, uh, Iran. Uh, also, I may add that Egypt has a sizable uh, Christian minority. At least 10% of the Egyptians are Christians. <coughs> it was very moving to see in Tahrir Square someone carrying the cross and the Quran marching together. And for the 18-day uprising, not a single church was attacked, or a synagogue, or a mosque. That is quite something, that you can see the union, the unity among the people for one reason, to remove Mubarak from office. Uh, quickly, just to add to what's been said already, similarity between Egypt and uh, Iran, both were ruled by a pro Western American supported despots in the case of Iran, the Shah of Iran, whose uh, uh, main contribution to you know, today's uh, uh, current situation in the Middle East is bringing the Iranian Islamic uh, uh, Iranian revolution because of his repressive regime uh, over the years. On the other hand, uh, Mubarak was also supported by the U.S. The byproduct of the Mubarak repressive regime was basically Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda is led by Ayman Zawahiri, the second man in Al-Qaeda, but in fact he's the brain behind Al-Qaeda and a lot of people think that Osama bin Laden is simply a financier of it. Again, because of his repressive regime, he drove the Muslim Brotherhood underground. Ayman Zawahiri was imprisoned, tortured, and then fled uh, Egypt. So as far as the similar, I, I think the similarity ends right there. Difference is Iran is a predominantly Shiite uh, society, and Egypt is a predominantly Sunni society. As you probably know, Sunnis account for about 90% of all Muslims in, in, in the world. Uh, secondly, Iran had a charismatic leader who actually was agitating against the Shah for years. Back in 75, in fact, he was kicked out of Iraq by Saddam Hussein because Saddam concluded a peace agreement with the Shah of Iran at the expense of the, the uh, uh, Khomeini propaganda machine which was spewing forth from Baghdad and then he had to relocate to Paris and then we all know what happened. He came back victorious to Iran. Egypt does not have such a <coughs> charismatic religious leader. Uh, be, be it, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, Jihad Islami, or what, what have you, they just don't have one. And they also want to be part of the, the political process. And they have said so repeatedly before, you know, Mubarak, during Mubarak, and even after uh, Mubarak. So it remains, it remains to be seen how they can be incorporated effectively and you know, properly within the democratic processes in, in Egypt, rather than alienate them, uh, repress them, and kind of force them into the, 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 the underground. Um, this is a slightly different perspective, and it's once again a highly personal perspective, but I think that what shifted for me when I lived there, and you know, by the way, knowing that there was going to be a revolution and there was going to be an election in September, I carefully planned my trip for the week of the revolution. <laughs> I planned to spend the month of February in Egypt, and I'm going next week. 
next month. But what I wanted to say was that the, in our country, I believe religion is largely compartmentalized. It's a Sunday affair or a Saturday affair if you're Jewish or a Friday affair if you're Muslim, but the religious practice, in my experience, is interwoven into the culture on a daily basis. And that's rather different. And that sensibility is somehow going to be, in my, my experience, expressed. I don't know what that means exactly, but their heritage is very different. We're founded on a nation that was escaping uh, religious suppression, and they're embracing and celebrating uh, a religious practice that means uh, a policeman will leave his station to pray at the, at the hour of prayer. We don't have anything like that in our culture. So it's a difference that I think we'll need to um, adapt to. It's not our country, it's not our culture. It's not our tradition. The question was, what it was the economy like before, and what possibly will the economy be like thereafter? The <coughs> Economy since, uh, I mean, uh, let me go back to what uh, uh, Sammy said in his opening remarks about Egypt having been actually uh, maintaining basically the same GMP as South Korea at, at one point. And this was, you know, even during uh, the socialist regime of uh, Nasser, which ended in 1970. When Sadat came to power after uh, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser's death, he adopted what he called the infitah policy, or the, the, the equivalent of Mikhail Gorbachev's glass notes, the opening. And what that did basically is concentrate development on uh, investments in hotels, tourism, which were good but only for a very small sector of the population. It opened the, the economy to foreign imports, closed uh, local industries which were very much accessible to the, the average Egyptian, and made it a, a extremely hard for them to actually buy anything made outside, outside of Egypt. So over the years when Mubarak came to power in 1981 after the assassination of Sadat, the cornerstone for this huge gap between rich and poor had been already laid by Sadat, and Mubarak simply took it to a, an entirely different new level, whereby cronyism and nepotism, his, his, his family you know, has, has thrived on making associations and connections and businesses and so on and so with so many different people, the steel magnet, you know, uh, uh, and Nagib uh, uh, Sawaris, the, the billionaire, and so on and so forth. That's how they made their, 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 their billions. So the upshot of this is that more than 40% of Egypt's 80 million population, 80 million plus, probably nobody knows, lives on a minimum a, a wage of two dollars a day. And a very small sector of the population benefited hugely in, in Egypt. And these are the people who are well connected. These are the people, incidentally, who also were part of his governing, uh, ruling uh, uh, party. And uh, the, the, the coalescence of politics and economics plus the, the uh, repression of all dissent in, in Egypt, have all created a, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of melting pot that had uh, a, the, the, the effect of explosion at one point or another. The US knew about it, the cables that were leaked by uh, WikiLeaks talked about it, but somehow 
The only people who didn't know about it were the American people because we were being uh, uh, basically sold a bill of goods about who's our ally and who's our enemy in that area. And uh, Mubarak was always thought of, conceived, and uh, uh, portrayed in the American media as an ally. And the only reason for that is that he did our bidding. I don't want to go into the, 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 the whole issue of what he did for the U.S. because I think everybody knows. Plus, they say that he kept the peace with Israel. In, in the meantime, the main question is, what about the interests of the Egyptian people? I mean, where, where do these interests fit in the overall scheme of our foreign policy in, in, in that region? And how long can we keep doing this over and over? Because it's a, it, it's a, it's a kind of a powder keg across the Arab world from you know, Gulf to ocean, as they, they call it, from Algeria all the way to the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Bahrain, the little country in, in the Gulf, has been also uh, uh, seeing demonstrating uh, demonstrations lately, and they killed two people. The, the emir, the prince, went on TV today, and he was apologizing for the deaths and uh, basically promising reform. The issue of the economy is only actually one facet in, in Egypt. It has a lot to do with politics and with the feeling of loss of dignity that the Egyptian people have felt now for the past actually 40 years since Sadat, mainly because they have been completely isolated from the, the, the Arab world. They were the heart of the Arab world, and now after the, the Camp David Accords, they simply were shorn off and became almost incidental to Arab politics and to the, the human resources of, 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 of the, the Arab world in general. And that's why the, the whole Arab world now is in jubilations because they feel that Egypt, with the January 25th uprising, has been restored to its rightful place at the heart of the Arab world, politically, culturally, economically, even mi mi militarily. Comment on education. Uh, you know, if Egypt is going to advance, uh, <clears throat> there is a uh, a whole educational system that needs to be uh, put in place, particularly for the poor. And uh, as in many of the these uh, developing nations, uh, education is very expensive. So if you want to get into the American university, you almost have to be part of the wealthy class. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> there, there is a two-tiered system of education. We have something like that here, but at least if you can, uh, at least some lower income people can go to Berkeley, at least they used to be able to, whether you can do that now, I don't know, given the way our economy is going. We're becoming somewhat similar. So in order to have, ec uh, my background is economic development. In order to have economic development, you have to have educational development to go with it. So part of, again, this future, we have to redirect some of our foreign aid so that <clears throat> we're not supporting the military. The military controls a large part of the Egyptian economy. Uh, I don't even think they pay tax on, the, uh, on what they earn. Is that correct? Who pays tax? The military. No. 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 So uh, they, they, they have a privileged position, and that's where most of our uh, foreign aid has gone. Or the, uh, so there, there has to be support for education if the economy, I think, is going to advance. And it has to spread beyond just a select few. I, I don't know if you agree with me on that. Yeah. Maybe you can Maybe comment on it. Yeah. I want to add something, because I think revolution, it, is, it was a huge step. But there must be another step. Uh, we can. My friends in Egypt, they said, uh, revolution like start line. And everything in Egypt must start to work and go forward. Education, uh, industry, everything. Not just, even people must, must uh, change their behavior or negative behavior. Must move forward. 
So if it's possible, I, I want to ask, in your opinion, what, is the, what you expect in the future? Because, okay, it is, there is revolution, but as you said, they need to fix many and many and many things. So what do you think? Uh, one reason behind the lack of progress in Egypt is that any advance in position is only depends on, on seniority, only. So there is no reason for anybody to try to achieve something because no matter how much they work hard, still you can be promoted unless you go by seniority. This has to stop. You have to reward people by their skill and their achievements and not by seniority. So this one thing must stop. If you compare the economy of Turkey with Egypt, we have a conference on Sunday at Santa Clara University in which we're going to be discussing a movement coming out of Turkey called the Hizmet Movement, the Gulen Movement, which this movement has inspired over a thousand schools throughout the world that specialize in science and math. And uh, <clears throat> it has, the, the level of education has developed very strongly within Turkey uh, and their schools now are throughout the world, not just in Turkey. But it's an educational movement, spiritual movement, inspired by a, a spiritual leader, but it has, they don't teach religion. They just teach, they provide very good education. Mm -hmm. So it has, uh, uh, <clears throat> these kinds of schools uh, have been, are there in Africa, they're in all over the Middle East now, and uh, they, they provide scholarship money uh, so Turkey has, is advancing very strongly economically. It's one of the, I think Turkey and Brazil are two of the strongest yeah. economies now mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, so we know it can be done, and it's there in, uh, but there has to be the educational and political infrastructure to, uh, like in Turkey what they do is the business people contribute to these schools. Instead of keeping all the money to themselves, if you're a successful businessman in Turkey and you're part of this movement, you donate to these schools to start a school. I was just there in Turkey uh, this past summer and uh, visited a number of these schools. So this kind of movement is what we need to get, I think, in Turkey as well. I, I mean, in Egypt. This was happening in a city in Egypt called Alexandria. Uh -huh. There was a governor there. He was a very nice man, and, and the people like him so much. But back to the point that the President Mubarak was a oppressive regime, when he thought that the man is very popular and uh, they like him, and he start to to apply this this model like the businessmen mm -hmm. don't pay bribes because Egypt like they live on bribes. Right. Don't pay bribes. Give the money to make something like anything to improve the, yeah. the community. So they start to do this, but he didn't give him the chance to do this. He just remove him when mm -hmm. he found that he had this this initiative to do. Popularity initiative and everything, and this is what is, was happening during the past 30 years. Anybody like have the the potential, like Amr Musa. Now we are, we, we we need to, to Amr Musa to come back. But when he notices that he has this uh, popularity, he just remove him, and this is this was happening. So these are it's a very concrete response, but um, in terms of specific changes, my understanding is that. If you're a president of a university, that needs to be re approved by the president of the country. Can yeah. you imagine? Imagine? So that's very concrete. That could change. It's not possible, in my experience, to simply walk onto a university campus. You have to have an ID that demonstrates you're a student. If you're a guest, you have to be approved by the security. If you don't get security clearance, and that works this way, we're working on it, weeks go by, we're working on it, and then you leave the country and they're still working on your security clearance. So imagine this panel, which was assembled two weeks ago, if we had to go through those kinds of steps, which all have to do with power and control exercised from the top.
is, um, how did, or, sorry, uh, did America's backing of Mubarak influence the average Egyptian, Egyptian's view of America, and if it did, then how so? Uh, the question again, did America's backing of Mubarak influence <laughs> influence the average Egyptian's view of America? I have always felt that the so-called friendly regimes in the Middle East, like the Egyptian regime and the Saudis, are in grave danger because our leaders in the Middle East, those friendly nations, leaders of the friendly nations, are unable to persuade the United States to resolve the issue of the Palestine people. Uh, they meet with the President of the United States, and they are very friendly, uh, but nevertheless, they have no power, they have no ability to persuade the American administration to take an even stand between Israel and the Palestinians. And this definitely has been noticed by the people. Uh, for how long will the presidents go and meet with Obama or others? and Netanyahu and shake hands. And at the same time, the continuous um, removal of Palestinians from their own homes. And this has angered the Middle East. Before 9-11, I was in Egypt, and I can feel the anger among the people that there is no resolution to the issue of Palestine. And um, so I expected something disastrous going to happen. I never imagined 9-11. But I expected something dramatic would take place, which it did. So I hope that's what I think, I hope I answered your question. That I, I just think that, uh, that they make a distinction in Egypt between the people of the United States and the government. They love Americans. They like us to come there. And uh, when we've been there, we've had very good times but they think our policy is wrong. So I think basically uh, that's, I don't know if you agree with me, but I, I think they, they're not, they, they have no ill feeling toward Americans. It's just they think our American foreign policy has been in the wrong direction for a long time. And uh, as Sammy said, if you're supporting dictatorships, if you don't see a resolution of the Palestinian problem and it's been going on now for, what, 50 years or so. Uh, <clears throat> there are people in the Middle East and in Egypt uh, feel that uh, the American policy is the problem, not the American people. But of course, that comes back to us. We are the American people. We elect our governments. And unless we uh, can bring about changes in our government, it does have an impact in the long run. May it, I add that uh, while we were in Egypt last year with 48 faculty and students, at no time uh, were the American students and the faculty in any danger, always being dealt with very friendly, and uh, the Egyptians have been very generous and respect very respectful for the Americans. And they wondered, how come you elected a man like, I'm sorry to say this, how come you elected Bush? You're such a wonderful people. How can you possibly do that? Twice, <laughs> twice. <laughs> so they're amazed how the American people are so different yeah. from the American government yeah. administration. One thing as a positive step we're trying to do, uh, at least in this Middle East project, we have um, uh, Ioana, Ioana Kutsi, who's here tonight, has developed a program with Walid Abu Amar at Al Azhar University. And uh, some of us will be going back to Al Azhar in June, and we're developing a Skype program where any student in any class who wants to participate in it, and if you're interested, you can see Ioana after the session. She's just put her hand up there. Mm -hmm. So basically, what we're doing is using a very, just like they're doing in Tahrir Square, we're using our technology to connect people between Egypt and the United States. And so, uh, the group at Al-Azhar has already formed, I think, 20 tandems, two people, willing to dialogue with students here. And if you can incorporate that into your class, if an instructor is willing to do it, then <clears throat> that can be part of 
the cre extra credit perhaps for that class or however you want to do it. So we already have a structure to do this and we like to see this idea spread where American students begin to get to know students in other parts of the world and you don't have to even travel there, you can just download Skype for free and, uh, and then you do a little report for your class and let your teacher give you extra credit. So I already did this last semester, it worked pretty well. Uh, in my classes, and so if you're interested, either instructor or student, you can see uh, Ioana Kutsi after our meeting. Let me just repeat it. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that um, one of them said that Tunisia and Egypt were part of the fuse that began this and began some of the things that are going on in the Middle East right now. And so uh, the latter part of your question was, uh, do any of you think that those countries that might be possibly going through this are as ripe as Egypt was for it? I think that uh, all people long for freedom. They want the nightmare to be over. They want the chains to be broken. And I think Tunisia, I'm amazed, we never expected Tunisia to be the few, to be where the, it all began in a small nation that we seldom hear about Tunisia. It happened there. So I think that uh, what happened in Tunisia and Egypt definitely had spread to Yemen and to Bahrain and other countries. They all want freedom, they want democracy. I think to throw in Pakistan in, in the mix uh, would, would, would be kind of uh, stretching it a bit too far because uh, Pakistan rarely uh, did influence what happens in, in the Arab street. Pakistan is in, you know, Southeast Asia, if you wish. It's a, uh, uh, the, the, the geographic distance is, is, is obvious, but more obvious too is the fact that uh, Pakistan is not an Arab country. Uh, Tunis, to Tunisia is an Arab country and so is Egypt. So what happens in one Arab country, you could, you could say, does have a bearing uh, somewhat on what happens in uh, another Arab country. Uh, the Arab world all kind of uh, share many uh, old as well as uh, uh, recent, you know, common history. Uh, the only thing in common between the Arab countries and countries like Iran and Pakistan is the fact that Pakistan and Iran are Muslim countries predominantly, but they don't speak Arabic, they're not part of the Arab world, they're not members of the Arab League, and so on and so forth. So having said that, what happened in Tunisia did have a great influence on Egypt, and I was reading an article actually that basically outlined the connection or connectiveness between the youth movement in Egypt and that in Tunisia, that they, these people have been in touch with each other now for a long time. It doesn't look like it, it looks like, you know, things started happening in Tunisia and all of a sudden, you know, the people in, in uh, Cairo uh, thought, well, if Tunisia can do it, so can we. But the reality is they have been coordinating for a long, long time. Uh, another uh, actually country that had something to do with what happened in, in Egypt in particular is Qatar. Qatar had a council, Council for Change, that was coordinating with these uh, with the youth movement in uh, in Egypt. Uh, one of the the, the leaders uh, you probably have seen him on 60 Minutes and on on other um, venues is Wael Ghanim, 
who was in the Arab working for, for uh, Google in the Arab Gulf. He was an executive, uh, marketing executive in the Arab Gulf. And he was in touch with this Council for Change in, in Qatar. Qatar also happens to house the much hated Al Jazeera Arabic and Al Jazeera English satellite channels, after which the Arab world has never been the same. So since the Al Jazeera Al uh, Arabic came on, on the scene, the Arab world has been more connected than ever. And uh, Qatar has been uh, in a precarious position with almost every single Arab regime. Uh, the regimes will cut off diplomatic relations with them, will kick out the Al Jazeera uh, you know, uh, uh, employees and so on and so forth. But the reality is this uh, uh, satellite channel, which has added a few years ago also an English uh, uh, equivalent, which has been actually used by the NBC, CBS, MSNBC, and even CNN, although we can't get it as Americans, because the Bush administration said, you know, you, uh, this is a, a terrorist uh, 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 channel. The reality is after Al Jazeera came into being, things have never been the same in the Arab world. One last uh, comment. Uh, the youth movement in uh, Egypt referred to invariably as the April 6 movement has been also active outside the Arab world they, in fact, were admirers of um, a, a Serbian youth movement, that a nonviolent movement that got rid of Milosevic. And a delegation of the Egyptian movement went to Serbia and met with, with, with some of the, these uh, uh, kids and learned a lot about the nonviolent uh, kind of methods that they used to uh, dismantle the Milosevic uh, uh, regime. The, the movement in Serbia is called Otpor, O-T-P-O-R. So the, uh, the fact that we only recently, two, two weeks ago, woke up to you know, trouble in, in, in Egypt doesn't really uh, kind of uh, give the movement the youth movement in Egypt and in, in Tunisia much justice because these people have been have been working day and night to launch this this uprising and uh, in fact some of them were jailed uh, 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 Ghanim had a youth group uh, I mean a, um, uh, a Facebook group in the name of one guy who was in fact tortured to death by the Mubarak regime, Khalid uh, Saeed. And he called it, we are all Khalid Saeed. And that's how the, the, the kind of uh, recruitment for his movement started among the, uh, the young uh, uh, professionals. The, uh, you hear a lot about the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, the Muslim Brotherhood was very reluctant to join the, the first demonstration because they believe that they're going to be clubbered. The Muslim Brotherhood were put in jail. Some of them were tortured to death. So they said, you know, this is not going to work with, with the Mubarak regime. Nonviolence doesn't, doesn't work. So they sat it out until the 28th of January when they realized that this movement actually was on the up, not the, 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 the down, and they didn't want to be caught you know, behind. Just another comment on uh, how this movement can spread beyond Egypt. Uh, I did economic development work in Bangladesh early in the 70s, uh, and uh, I was involved in starting a nonprofit, and we did economic development. Well, Muhammad Yunus, who started the microcredit program in Bangladesh, now that's spread throughout the world. We're in this globalization for better or for worse, where movements spread very quickly across borders. And for example, there's microcredit now in Egypt, the, sponsored by the Aga Khan network, which is another reform movement within Shia Islam, and it's very active in Africa. Uh, Aga Khan? Aga Khan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so these movements, with the uh, spread of the internet, like in Bangladesh, the Muhammad Yunus is going to help set up uh, internet cafes throughout the country. It's 150 million people. 
So as the, the developing world gets access to the internet and to these, I think they learn of these things. They say, well, we, if they did it, why can't we? So I think even economically, getting back to the question of economic development, I see a bright future uh, in the working at the bottom of society. We need to create programs Mohammed Yunus is coming to the United States. He wants to put up his microcredit program in the inner city in Detroit, like for example, or other cities. We need it in the United States just as well. So this is a global phenomenon of change, transformation, and I don't think it's limited to one part of the world. So the question is, where do we go from here, and what are some of the policies and procedures and things of that nature to go forward? Let somebody else answer that. You mean for us Americans or for the Egyptians? Oh, for the the the. Well, I think that the uh, a lot of the the youth movement members have already stated that what they did was the easy part. Now, the hard part of rebuilding uh, Egypt, restoring institutions, restoring the economic and political infrastructure to, to a nation that's been decimated by one man ruled for 30 years who eliminated any kind of dissent and any kind of alternative, you know, viable alternative options like, you know, Amr, Amr Musa and, and, and others. This is the hard part. Uh, in the immediate uh, uh, future though, what needs to be done is for the, the Egyptian youth movement to put pressure on the military to make sure that they stay honest, that they don't fall in love with, with the government, and stay in power for good. Because now they have dismantled the, the constitution, uh, dismantled the, the parliament, but the parliament was, you know, uh, came to, to, to power through fake elect phony elections anyway and there is no, no president. The real concern is that some of these people in the military may keep the emergency law for the foreseeable future and basically uh, kind of, uh, you know, water down the gains of the uprising. And that's why some of the, the, the movement at this point is kind of split because some of them want to stay in Tahrir Square uh, on a, and go demonstrating on a weekly basis until there is a civil government, until there are elections, and until there is actually a, a, a repudiation or a cancellation of the emergency law. So none of that has happened uh, uh, so far. The only thing that they managed to do is get rid of Mubarak. Mubarak is still reportedly in Sharm el-Sheikh. Uh, reportedly, the, uh, the new government has not asked foreign powers to actually uh, uh, you know, seize his uh, uh, bank accounts. They have asked for the, the former interior minister's bank account and other people, but not Mubarak's, which makes you wonder, because you know, the defense minister, who is de facto president at this point, he's the head of state, he's the head of the Supreme Council, military council, was appointed by him. He's a 75-year-old man, and he's a you know, Mubarak uh, uh, guy. So that's why the, the youth movement is very concerned that if they let off the, the pressure, then the changes will basically slow down and maybe not take place at all. I might have to have you repeat that. I think. Uh, in what ways do you expect Egypt's democracy to be different from ours? In what ways do you expect Egypt's democracy to be different from ours? Yeah. So will there be the same federal and state system? 
Will there be the same federal and state system? Will there be uh, se seats, set aside. seats oh, set aside for minorities and Uh, will it be a coalition of many different parties or two or three party system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, I, don't, I don't think a democracy is viable without multiple party you know, system. I don't think a, a, a democracy is viable without uh, uh, safeguarding the uh, rights of minorities. However, having said that, is it going to be uh, a, a model uh, built on you know, the US, built on <coughs> France, built on Britain? I mean, each country has its own kind of uh, set of uh, circumstances, indigenous values that always you know, are reflected in the, the kind of democratic government that they fashion. And hopefully, you know, Egypt. I mean, the Egyptians are very smart people, highly educated. They've, you know, they, they had cinema in, in Egypt long before countries in Europe uh, uh, did. They had court system. They had, I mean, the fact that this, this whole infrastructure needs to be rebuilt doesn't mean that it, it cannot be. But it's going to be a painful process. It's going to be reflective of what the Egyptians actually need rather than copying a model that is imported from the outside. If, 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 if we uh, kind of uh, learned anything from the uh, Iraq invasion debacle, it's the fact that you can never you know, uh, wrap a democracy in a gift wrap and give it to people. So you can imagine that the, the trillions of dollars that have been wasted on decimating the infrastructure of, of Iraq and uh, basically uh, earning us the enmity of the Arab people, all 300 million plus of them, and not to mention the, you know, the, 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 the whole Islamic world. And in, we, we, have, we have nothing to show for it, in fact, either in Afghanistan or in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, by comparison, look at what happened in, in Tunisia. And look at what happened in, in Egypt. We had nothing to do with it. In, in, in fact, if anything, we tried to forestall these, these democratic you know, uprisings in both countries. We tried to slow them down. We tried to kind of uh, uh, frustrate them and so on and so forth, but the reality is, as I said in my openings, the, the people power is unstoppable. And you cannot you know, buy it with, off with, with money, and you cannot simply plant democracy, American style, in, in Iraq by sending 100,000 American troops. And you cannot do it in, in Afghanistan. Each country has its own kind of indigenous and, and respective uh, uh, circumstances. And you know, I trust that the Egyptians, being an, an, an ancient civilization, will take very good care of, 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 of their needs. And not only that, but they will serve as a viable model for all the, the Arab people uh, in, you know, in, in that region as well. other questions? I actually would like to have each of your opinions, um, especially Mustafa's and Lapi's, uh, regarding what we Americans are going to do henceforth. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about our Christian right and um, what some of us might term fear-mongering from the likes of people like Glenn Beck or you know, question, Pat yeah. Robertson, who say, well, the issue here in what we should be frightened, we Americans should be frightened about Muslims taking over the world and establishing caliphates 
And to some of us, it sounds ridiculous, but to many of us, it does not. And especially the part about, well, now, the right of Israel to, to exist will be eliminated. That's first on their agenda. And so, what do we Americans, what do we do with all that? <laughs> well, first, I think I, will, I, will, I was reading something of what the world leaders say about the, what happened in Egypt. President Obama said that our, our young people had to, to take lessons from this. Uh, Perlusconi said that uh, Egyptian made history again. Uh, James Cameron in England said that they will teach the Egyptian revolution in the schools to teach them what the young people ha had to do. So the Americans is like <clears throat> they, ha they have to, to look at this and to, to see what, what, what's happening. And you know, for us as scholars, we came, we, we, before we came here, and you were there when they were teaching us that how to deal with Americans and don't, don't, don't judge Americans from movies and from Hollywood. So now, now I'm starting to know that uh, uh, now I know Americans and I know that, that they, are, they are different than the government. And this is <clears throat> what we will do when we come back to, to Egypt because yes, the, sometimes the uh, people are like covered and the governments talk with their names while they, they have the op opposite opinion. Last night I was talking to a group of Iranians, the first time to hear that they like President Sadat. Why? We know that the government of Iran, they hate President Sadat too much. Like, so the first time to see that the, the government opinion always different than the people's opinion. For me, I think it uh, was a part of the previous regime point of view. They succeeded to make, make the American government <coughs> feel that there is only <coughs> Egypt one safe room. And this room, the title is Hosni Mubarak. If uh, America went out of this room, they will find Islamists uh, carrying guns and they will finish them. And also, even until the last minutes of his uh, previous regime, he said, <coughs> I am afraid that if I moved, that the Islamists will control the country and they will do unbelievable things. But for me, I think it is now the turn of the American people, not the American government, to touch or to connect to Amer Egyptian people, not to see them from news, not to see them from the point of view of American, even American government. So as Lotfi said, now we know Americans. So you have to come to Egypt and live there with people to know Egyptians and Egypt. The, the flip side of what uh, of Pat Robertson's statement is the only way for us Americans to safeguard our interests in that region and prevent a, an Islamic takeover is to support despotic regimes like uh, Mubarak. And to me, that's both wrong-headed and, and silly because as, as we have seen, uh, Mubarak uh, has, in fact, <coughs> produced Ayman Zawahiri because of his oppressive regime. So how is that adding to our you know, uh, security? What we're doing in, in Afghanistan now is, in fact, a direct result of the repressive practices of Mubarak, who created people like bin Laden and, and so a repressive regime in Saudi which created uh, uh, bin Laden and so on and, and so forth. So in the long run, I mean, I'm not talking to Robertson because he's not somebody you can talk to. I mean, the, 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 there are people you can talk to and there are people you can't, you know, you just say uh-huh to and, and just move on because it's a complete waste of, of, of energy. Uh, uh, what, what, what I'm saying is the only way to safeguard our interests as a people, not as a government, not as corporate structure in, in this country, is to support the will of the peoples in these different nations rather than thwart them.
That's the best way. Because whenever you have a regime that reflects the will of the people, that is democratically elected, that is accountable, then it will be a lot harder for one person like Mubarak, one person like Abdullah, one person like Zainuddin uh, uh, bin, bin, bin Ali in Tunis to simply make these outrageous deals with the US on the back of its own, of his own people and thus create enemies for the US in the process. So as far as the, the Islamic takeover, we've been hearing this actually since the days of the crusade and hasn't materialized yet. So. <laughs> I wanted to say something about our responsibility at this time because we've been focusing on the Egyptian responsibility and my understanding is that the Egyptian military has great power and great wealth. And, and I think they will let, I fear they will let go of both reluctantly. So the question then is what will we as Americans in terms of our military and our State Department, what will we support? Will we support the will of the people or will we once again support this nexus of power from one military to another military? So I'm, I'm watching hopefully with guarded optimism and some grave concerns in terms of what unfolds. And, and we have a role to play now. We have a moral responsibility to the young people of Egypt. I just have one suggestion, again, how we go forward to Cindy's comment about the religious right. There's a relationship between the religious right and the political right in that if you're a fundamentalist in religion, you're gonna be a fundamentalist in politics. So we have a large Muslim population in the United States. If we can show how the Muslim population here is integrated into our culture, and we defeat the fear mongers, issues like the mosque in New York, which has been you know, picked up by the relig uh, religious and political right, we need to reach out to our Muslim community that's here, right here in the United States, and show that these relationships between Muslims and non-Muslims are very good, very positive. And highlight that and show, because these other movements, they're like 51%, I just saw today, 51% of Republicans still don't think um, Obama is, has born in the United States. So, you know, the, the, if, you, if you are a fundamentalist in your thinking, you're gonna think things are gonna be skewed. So we need to reach out, I think, to the um, Muslims right within us, within our United States, because they're becoming a very large proportion of our, our, our society. Three hundred million, I think, isn't it? Uh, no. Yeah, three, 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 yeah. three hundred. Yeah. Million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <coughs> there are a lot of, uh, you know, wherever you, if you get involved with your local mosque, they usually have during Ramadan they have opportunities for uh, outreach to be part of it. So I think we just need to see that the Muslim community here in the United States is part of us, and we need to embrace that and show that pluralism works. Because the caliphate is based upon something else. I have one more question too. In many of the conversations that I've been having with people recently or as of late, what I've realized is that many people are saying, well, you know, with everything that's going on in Egypt right now, the alternative or the fear, as you were saying, is what's going to happen? How is this going to affect us? And what's interesting is what I'm hearing is that oppression and stability are being um, aligned with one another. Whereas because it's been this way for 30 years, we've had a sense of stability. And now, because it's not like this, there's going to be chaos. And what Khalil 
Gill has um, stated and emphasized over and over again, as well as the other scholars, I think, which is a salient point, is that there are myriad forms of democracy. And what's going to happen in Egypt going forward is going to take a variety of different forms, and they're going to go through a lot of different errors and, um, in order to find where they are. So my question to Lafayette and Mustafa is, in the conversations that you've had with your friends back home and your relatives back home, the easy part maybe has been done, which didn't seem easy to us at all, which is this revolution. But have they kind of, are they now at that point where they're mulling over where, what's happening next? And are they preparing themselves for, this is gonna be difficult for a long time before we get to any point of feeling the benefits or ramifications of what's happened? I think so. I think this was my, my me and Mustafa question from the beginning, like, what next? Because next is, is so big because corruption in Egypt is is everywhere. And in, in the governmental circle and everything, if you need to show to issue an ID, you have to pay if you need it's a police department. So yeah, it needs but needs like people to to be cooperative together and to start to believe in this. Now they are Facebook is great because now all people connected and they are keep killing each other and keep like refreshing each other because because it needs like uh, a long time, long time, years. But we have to believe in this. Like when we see it step by step, eh, but we need we need all to to be cooperative with this. It's, it will be so hard. Like, you, you can't imagine. But uh, since this is the start, and they start after they remove everything from the Tahrir Square and they clean everything, they bring it like brand new, so it, it was like a spark like that it, these people will, will stay together and stay like this, and the army is, is, is backing up this. I think these six months will be like uh, a test for what will happen after the constitu new constitution and the parliament uh, election and then the presidential election. I think after September we'll see that we'll see it start again. Also, I just heard from my friends in Egypt that they start something like a campaign under the title of uh, Start by Yourself. Because individual is the main thing of, any, of anything, actually. So it is your uh, revolution. It is your achievement. It is your success. So you have to start by yourself. You have to protect this from your inside, not protect first from, from yourself and then from the people around you. So I think to start by yourself, it is now it is the main thing in Egypt. Um, gosh, thank you all so much. I oh, have. Uh, yeah. um, I'd like to make maybe one more comment. Excuse me, I need to tell an uh, Egyptian joke about this. Uh, oh, sure. But I, I don't know about the translation, but it's like. Uh, so uh, when uh, President, uh, ex-President uh, Ben Ali, he was in Saudi Arabia watching Al Jazeera in a big TV because they put him in a palace. So he's watching, and then the protest in Egypt starts. So grab the phone and say, President Mubarak, please bring your PlayStation joystick and join me. <laughs> it was very bored. <laughs> Green what? Joystick. Oh, that's funny. Um, one of the things that global education here at West Valley College has been that we continually think about in our meetings is how do we take what we're doing, for example, and enact it in a clear, tangible way? And I think what this dialogue today has done, and necessarily so, is it's brought something that is happening in our media and has brought something that is happening in another part of the world to the here and now. And what's been wonderful about this discussion is that we've moved from politics and the theoretical to the practical. And I think what we've realized also in this particular discussion is that behind revolution, slavery, oppression, um, the robbing of dignity, 
our faces, brothers, mothers, sisters, and all of those individuals. And I think uh, um, Gerald and Jacqueline and Sammy and Khalil have said this over and over and over again. Part of this and what's happening to our world needs to begin with us thinking about Egyptians, but not just Egyptians, everybody, not as people in the collective, but as individuals. And these discussions, the Skype that we were talking about, and the ability to be able to dialogue with other individuals about themselves is, again, bringing the global and the local in such a way because everything that we do, every vote that we do or do not uh, participate in, every action that we decide to um, not think about or think about will have its ramifications somewhere else and ultimately always comes back to us. But maybe in some way we can kind of break down this looking through the lens of just us so that when we actually make um, gestures and actions, it's really with the mind of not just us, but us in a sense. So again, thank you for coming. And thank you, scholars. I, and and Mustafa.